I actually believe one of the greatest crises in the world at the moment is that the so-called establishment to which we all belong has atrophied to the point that we do not realize what revolution actually means by, by, within innovation. The great engineers would be turning in their graves if they looked at the slow speed with which we adopt every tiny little tweak of innovation. I thought it was really pointless me getting up on stage and giving you a really serious talk about the future of construction and all the rest of it without actually telling you a few stories. October 2017, a remarkable thing happened that many of you will have heard of. A space object went past planet Earth and was detected. It was followed. It was going very fast, so it wasn't followed for very long. And at the end of it, it made a kink left and disappeared from our solar system. Quite remarkable, really. It defied all, all of the laws of astron astronomical physics. The interesting thing about it, though, to me, is that the main champion for this space event is a guy called Professor Avi Loeb. Not some casual dude. He is professor of astrophysics at Harvard. In fact, he's probably the best astrophysicist currently working today. And he wrote a book about this event called Extraterrestrial. And his summary of what he's learned from that event should shock you very, very deeply. The subject of my few minutes on stage is the danger of becoming a member of the establishment and then so addicted to the easy money of universities and big funds and all of that sort of stuff that you can't wait to get your nose in that trough and suck deeply. What Avi Loeb said was he talked to all his contemporaries, and almost all of them said, well, it was a strange thing. You know, da, da. He said, a strange thing, it has broken the laws of astrophysics, and you're thinking it's a strange thing. He said, to his astonishment, none of his contemporaries were taking, well, very few of his contemporaries were taking this seriously. And he said it suddenly dawned on him something utterly terrifying, that the world of science where almost every single living scientist says that their hero is the brave Galileo and identify their personality with Galileo has actually turned into, like the invasion of the body snatchers, they have all become the administrators that would like to have burnt him at the stake. You see, I'm not joking. I'm saying it in a jokey voice. That's the way you do it in England. You know, if you're going to be really, really rude, you make a joke. I have noticed, for example, I work with many of the world's top universities. And I would say that many of the world's top universities are guilty of treason. Treason. They've become so fat, so happy at their ways of working, that the national interest, the global interest, is of very little interest to many of them to try and get them to work. You'll have heard these words, of course. Let us work in a multidisciplinary fashion. What multidisciplinary means, for those of you who don't understand weasel words, is multidisciplinary means I can still keep my grants and I'll work with other people. Transdisciplinary, that's dangerous. It means you've got to actually collaborate really, really closely. But I want you to think about Avi Loeb and what that means in our professions. All of the comfortable people you know who have their, their, companies, uh, their company uh, prospectuses and whatever, do you recognize these words? Center of excellence, out of the box, joined up thinking, thinking the unthinkable, leading edge, bleeding edge, cutting edge, ether thinking. We're going to be so creative. We're going to be innovative to a fault. Creativity is us. Do you recognize that almost every uninnovative organization in the world uses that language to cover up the fact that they wouldn't recognize innovation if it bit them on the arse. They want to turn up to fora, to conferences, to drink in the bar, to say the right things, and they do Fanny Adam. 
I actually believe one of the greatest crises in the world at the moment is that the so-called establishment to which we all belong has atrophied to the point that we do not realize what revolution actually means by, by, within in innovation. The great engineers would be turning in their graves if they looked at the slow speed with which we adopt every tiny little tweak of innovation. We can raise a list, like Steph just did, of all the things that are wrong in the world. I made a speech at the 500th anniversary of my school three days ago, and I said, you know who I hate the most? I hate the press. You know why I hate the press? Because they are paid to make sure that if it bleeds, it leads. Which means that every young person, probably in the, the whole of the Western world at least, believes we're going to hell in a handcart. They believe everything is wrong, that the adults have failed completely. You never hear about the revolutions, the quiet revolutions that are taking place everywhere. You don't hear about, you don't hear about the fact that this, the, 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 the discovery and huge insights that are coming into our planet to do with the understanding of mycorrhizal associations, the fungal structures in the soil. You don't hear about what that might mean in terms of the biological relationship with our human biome. Nor yet do you hear that the biological relationships in our human biome have an awful lot in common with those mycorrhizal associations. And it also is really interesting, isn't it, that we're living in a period of largely secular thinking. Largely secular thinking. And most of you in the audience who are wonderfully young, damn you all, but, no, but, but uh, are going to live through a period of spiritual renewal with a small s of monstrous proportions as we start to realize we are creatures like every other creature and we're going to stop claiming specialness for ourselves because of course that is the myth by which all humans live that the purpose of evolution was us it's true isn't it i run a place called the eden project in cornwall which began it opened in 2000 we let people come in while we were building and when we had half a million people come in as we were building we discovered that is a really good construction project because no builder is going to sit on a bloody spade when you've got half a million people looking at you right so we actually we built it on time on budget it's now cost 144 million we've put 2.2 billion pounds into the cornish economy a lot of money. We are pound for pound probably the best investment that the British government has ever invested in in the last 50 years. I'm going to come on to why, because it's all to do with why we're here together. But I'm going to go back. 1834, the worst, word, the, worst, the worst year for the English language. Do you know what word first appeared in print in 1834? Science. The word science arrived in print in the late autumn of 1834 and from that moment on scientists started to colonize the world of knowledge you were no longer a natural philosopher seeing the world in the round the whole scope of humanity and the natural world working interwoven in a way with the systems observed as being interrelated no now we had the geologies the zoologies the biologies the physics the chemistry and then you had the subsets the biological chemistry and whatever and each of them with gangs of people doing this with the knowledge so that more and more people knew less and less and less but they knew a hell of a lot about the outside wing flap of a fly but the importance of realizing this damage is that almost everywhere in the world today, when you go to universities, you hear academics talking about, well, they go to multidisciplinary. They, they, they start to wince when you get to transdisciplinary. But they realize that most of the world's big problems are systems problems. And systems does not involve meeting to talk about yet another siloed activity. It really doesn't. Systems are my obsession. Emergence, as a word, is also my obsession. Emergence is where systems work closely together and, thi and things bring out qualities that we did not know exist simply through their working together. It is very sexy indeed. A very good example of it is the human body, which if I took you to bits with a pair of tweezers and piled you up in the middle of the stage, you'd be dead, wouldn't you? So, well, obviously you'd be dead. Well, unless you're rather a miracle. But the thing that's really interesting is then what the hell is life? There is nothing in the human body that betrays the fact that, the, that you are alive. I have a theory about systems. But when you look at the success of the Eden Project, the reason it is successful is because we based it on systems. And I was lucky enough to meet a man before I started building who told me of a big project he'd worked on and he'd made lots of mistakes. 
The biggest mistake he made was that when he went to the place to do his project, he saw it in his imagination. He never tasted it in reality. He never found out who were the people who lived there. He just did his thing to them. It's a very Western trait. Let's do our vision for you, to you. And I thought about that, and I realized that if you're going to be a capitalist, and I am a capitalist, but I've also got a very strong socialist tendency, you've got to work out any project you are investing in has got to have a long outturn so that everybody in your community can actually benefit from what you do. So if you know, if, if, if what we did, like in 1997, I started to award ice cream contracts for opening in 2000. Everybody said, you're effing mad. It's mad. And I said, I'm not mad, because if we want our neighbors to be able to supply us, they need to be able to grow before we exist to meet the demands we're going to have. They will not be lent the money by a bank unless they've got a long-term contract with the Eden Project which says that they can supply us. So here's the rub. I said, I will give you a three-year contract to supply us with ice cream, which is a very long time. Right? In return, at the end of three years, we want you to have made everything you do sustainable. And we want you to be waste neutral. And if you have succeeded in that after three years, we will give you another three-year contract. It is amazing how much change you can enforce if you organize how a system works. So all our suppliers, we contracted a long, long time in advance. 80% of the suppliers to the Eden Project, which is about 1,700 of them, are local. It has created an economy. That economy has fed through into a school system where hope did not exist, where now the teachers see that the pupils, they realize there could be good jobs, not just waiting tables, but there are scientific jobs to be had at the Eden Project. We work all over the world, but Cornwall is important to us because it's a demonstration of a place which hope had forgotten. Like many places in every one of the countries that represented here today, there are places where it was once successful, but it now feels like it's haunted by, by lack of hope, by feeling that somehow success will never return here. And it's that story you have to break. You have to actually make people believe there is a narrative that can actually really get people excited. That is why I wanted to talk to you, because one of the things is the way we've all been brought up is you want to do a small project and we'll make it successful. The problem is most people cannot get excited by a small project. The majority of my colleagues at work are old. Do you know why I chose old people to work? I've got a lot of youngsters as well. I chose old people because most people have got a grain of disappointment that inhabits them. It is that thought that at the age of 19 they had dreams about who they could become. And the older they've got, the more they realize they've disappointed themselves. And there's nothing worse than disappointing yourself. So if you can paint a picture, a dream, a stage on which people can perform and they've got one last shot to bring everything they've learned in their life now to great fruition, it is so exciting for them. But you know, the other thing is that when you start bringing on youngsters, this is an area where there was no management class unemployment because there were no businesses. So the only youngsters that we could get to do management, they'd seen TV shows on which managers managed and they said, you do this, you do that, the other. So we had to train 500 people up to man this great ship. Now, when you know you're doing that, you talk to the education establishment before you're going to do it, so they create courses and a curriculum, so everything falls, it's like, it's like a, I hate to say the word military, because it's inappropriate, but you, you, you've pre-planned to create the success, and you must never use the word if. I find my staff if they ever use the word if, because the word when is amazingly powerful. It takes about three months of the word when for people to just think it's a question of time. Then you need to talk to people who are going to give you money, and you need to talk to them about the excitement of working with you. And then you need to remind them of the tragedy of the poor man who discovered the Beatles and then said that guitar bands weren't going to catch on. And then you need to remind them of the terrible shame that their grandchildren will know that they did not support you. The fear of death and the death of legacy are the most powerful, powerful incentives. But the thing about big, the Eden Project is we turn over, we're small in terms of turnover, we turn over 30 million a year. But we're now about, we're, we're building in some countries, we're building 17 different projects. We've got five wild projects, we're in every inhabited continent of the world. 
and we're, we've got a whole heap of stuff we've been asked to green Canary Wharf in uh, London, you know, that phallic business centre in the middle of London. And it's, it's crazy because the world is full of people wanting to invest in what they call ESG. And they're all people who are, wait, man, we're into zero carbon. And then you say to people, what do you know about zero carbon? And the truth is they know nothing about zero carbon. They don't know how to get to zero carbon. They don't even realize that zero carbon still means that millions of people are going to fry to death. But it's a slogan, marketing-led slogan. And then you get the young kids trying to sell you carbon offsets with trees. Don't you love that? Then you say, what the fuck do you guys know about trees? And you discover they know nothing about trees, except that if you plant them, they're supposed to be absorbing carbon. And you say, do you realize that, that m many trees don't absorb much carbon? And many of the trees that you plant to absorb a lot of carbon actually are wrong for the place. And also, if you don't give the people who are going to look after the trees that are going to be absorbing the carbon, if you don't make it good for them, they'll use it for firewood in a very short period of time, or they will just die through neglect. It's a whole story you've got to put in place, a whole system. You've got to think of the whole series of consequences like a jigsaw. Sorry, I'm spitting a lot. It's a, it's a, it's a, pass, it's a passing phase. I'm an old guy and I've lost my teeth. That's, it's, not, it's not true. It's not true. Um, so, big. Think big. Think you're not in the establishment for a moment. Stop being sold to. I often go to big corporates and I ask people to write down the name of the three people that they most admire in the world that others would have heard of. You know what they've all got in common? They've got something in common with the lead act tonight. They're not for sale. People actually really admire people that are not for sale. It matters. And we need to be better than we've been. Our grouping, our movement, our our thinking has got to be better than a series of marketing sound bites and leadership team grouping things together where we all hold hands and fall over. And then let's move, weave, weave some muesli together. I'm an environmentalist, but I hate environmentalists. My God, are they boring. I mean, it, my idea, I'd rather drill my teeth without anesthetic than have to go to a desert island with an environmentalist. In fact, makes me want to drive a very fast car. Um, I say this, I'm obviously I'm lighthearted about it, but part of the problem with being us bright people who are involved in this area and we're flattered to be invited to a place like this, real difference involves storytelling where a whole bunch of people that we have a duty to care for, because we are so lucky, we have a duty to care for, are suffering because of our predominantly male vanities. I say that in a predominantly female audience, but... but it's men, always men, who want to be heroes. And actually, the last thing I want to talk about is where, you, where one can be a hero. We've, we've got two big projects um, in, in Britain. I wasn't going to talk about them, but it's sort of kind of naturally got there. Which are where a city has come to us and said, help us. Then you go to the city and you realize there's all sorts of good things there, but no one can see them anymore because they got so depressed with the city. And then you start helping them, see it, and then you keep telling them it's their idea and it gets better and better and better and better and better and better. And there was no money. Everybody says there's no money, but there's flood defense. And someone says, what happens if we rip up half of the town and create a marsh in the middle of it? And then we can advertise what an incredible city we are. And suddenly people go, you can't do that. And you say, why? Because. Why? And our job, our duty, ladies and gentlemen, is to be at the edge of the why. Why not? We could spend an awful lot of time, and many of you are wizards at materials. But the thing we've got to be doing is creating places. Creating places where people want to walk romantically, where people feel like working, where feel, people feel that civic responsibility is something that is in the core of their being. It isn't about the materials of a building. It is about beauty. It is about love. Dare I say it? So much of what we have that is ugly is so dispiriting. It is morale sapping. And beauty is not, it really is not a function of the money you spend on it. It is a function of the attitude you embrace it with. And also, don't believe politicians. Not that for a moment I thought any of you did. But we had the awful situation of having our prime minister, Mr. Johnson. I refuse to call him Boris. Um, come to the G7 at, at Eden, and I said, Mr. Johnson, do you want to understand about deep geothermal energy? He said, <laughs> and, and, um, and I said, I said um, it's actually the answer. And I said, can I be very rude to you? 
And he said, right. And he said, I, said, I said, if I was Prime Minister of Britain, I could make the whole of this country energy independent with renewable energy by the year 2030, not 2050. It is easy. But what do you expect with the quality of advice you're getting with half the interns that you've got in many of your government departments come from the fossil fuel industry? Half the advice you get that says you can't do this comes from the fossil fuel industry. No one is looking, for example, at the crops we grow. The seven major crops we grow in the world today are addicted to fossil fuels. And very few people, there's two in this room, I, I, I talk about it, are starting to think, oh my God, that is a major issue. What are we going to grow for food? It's okay. Big agriculture didn't kill off heirloom vegetables. It was big agriculture coined the phrase heirloom vegetables so that you thought it was old fashioned. They didn't all grow the same roundness or the same redness, but they are brilliant at growing in land that is not fertilized or pesticided with chemicals. I end by saying the world is really, really hopeful. We're not going to hell in a handcart, but those of us who are fortunate to come to places like this ought to dedicate ourselves to the understanding of beauty and the understanding that our key duty is not to have people in Palo Alto so excited about this little project they're funding or people from all the other smart cities. We have millions and millions and millions of people, millions, more millions than you can count who do not have housing or safe housing. They do not have water. And are you telling me we're not intelligent enough to do it? We sure are. The trouble is we're not dreaming. We're not dreaming. And we are the dreaming ape, homo sapiens sapiens, so wise, we named ourselves twice. Well, isn't it a tremendous indictment, indictment, not indictment, indictment on us that the dreams we set for ourselves are so modest? So I wanted to open this marvelous event by saying we have a duty to dream big and to also call shit shit when you see it. Thank you.